That's right, y'all. The juice is officially loose once again. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, the long-awaited sequel to the 1988 classic, is finally here. The original film is a staple of Halloween movie rewatches. It was the first time that Tim Burton got to really introduce his iconic style to general audiences. It was a much smaller film that grows significantly more than its budget and has since become a cultural phenomenon. So why are we just now getting a sequel after 36 years? Well, it's no secret that we're living in an era of Hollywood that is predicated on nostalgia. It seems like every big movie to come out of the major studios within the last few years has been a sequel or part of a franchise. And obviously there are a ton of incredible original movies still being made today, even if unfortunately people aren't going to see them as much. But that speaks to one of the major issues with this new trend. Sure, just because a movie is a sequel or part of a franchise doesn't automatically mean that it's going to be bad, but a majority majority of the time, the reason that the film itself exists isn't because a team of creative filmmakers had a great idea for a sequel, it's because a studio executive knew that it would make a lot of money and push the movie to be made regardless of the quality. But I was relieved to learn that the sequel to Beetlejuice would probably be an exception to that rule. Because a sequel to this film has been in development since the early 90s, with several variations of a script being thrown around like Beetlejuice Goes Hawaiian and then another version that was almost made in the 2010s. And yeah, while I'm sure this is a film that Warner Brothers has been pushing for for a while, it seemed like it wasn't going to be forced into being made. Michael Keaton and Winona Ryder said they would only return if they liked the story, and if Tim Burton also returned to direct. And the whole team was very passionate about doing this sequel justice, and focusing on things like practical effects and other elements that made the first movie so special. And for the most part, I'm happy to report that they succeeded, at least on that front. I wouldn't go so far far as to say that Tim Burton is back, but it feels like he really went back to his roots on this one, and it's a massive improvement from some of his most recent films. Because this movie does a great job of mixing practical effects and CGI, adding attention to detail in their costumes and makeup, going all out on their set pieces, draping each scene in colorful lighting, adding in some stop motion animation whenever they could, they just really kept that high production value that you'd hope to see in a Beetlejuice sequel. And I really have to give credit to any big studio film that steps outside of the green screen machine and reminds us how good a big budget blockbuster can look. But aside from the technical achievements, this film does have a few shortcomings. The movie follows Winona Ryder's character back again as Lydia Dietz, who has capitalized on her ghost seeing abilities and for some reason is profiting off of that with a ghost hunter style knockoff show. She then receives word of a family tragedy that forces her to reconcile with her daughter Astrid, played by Jenna Ortega. Meanwhile, Beetlejuice's business is booming, and he continues to haunt Lydia Dietz every once in a while from afar. He then receives word that his ex-wife, a soul sucker named Dolores, played by Monica Bellucci, is back in the picture and is going on a killing spree looking for him. And look, it may seem like I'm over-explaining the plot of this movie, but trust me, there is so much that I'm leaving out here. And spoilers ahead, if you haven't seen the movie yet, you might want to like, subscribe, and come back later. But I haven't even mentioned that Lydia is dating her slime TV producer played by Justin Thoreau. Willem Dafoe is playing a B-list actor turned afterlife detective. Jenna Ortega's character sparks up a cute romance with a local boy that takes a clever twist. Charles Dietz got eaten by a shark and is bumbling around the afterlife with half his body missing. And I'm still leaving out a lot of things that happen. And don't get me wrong, I love all of these new characters and every storyline is founded on these really interesting concepts, but there's just way too much going on here. And I give them credit for managing to juggle this many threads and weave them together so well, but I think just because there's so many storylines going on, nothing gets the chance to properly develop. Every conclusion is rushed through, and half of these stories feel so inconsequential and almost lazily tacked on, even if they are enjoyable. Like, I think Dolores' introduction scene is one of my favorites in the whole movie. I love watching her slowly reconstruct herself. I also love that they have this really cool scene in Black and white that was spoken in Italian of Beetlejuice telling the story of their history together, which was a great setup, and I was so excited to see where her character went from there, but then her only other scenes in the movie just involve her shouting, where is Beetlejuice at everyone? And she's not given much else to do. Then she gets defeated so quickly that it felt like it didn't really matter. That also goes for the story of Astrid and Jeremy. They do a great job of building up this cute romance, leaving a few clues to set up a twist, and then revealing 
feeling that he is a ghost with ulterior motive. And this story definitely did feel a lot more developed than any other storyline in the movie. But then once again, he's defeated very quickly and we move on to the next thing and just forget about it. Which then immediately transitions into the storyline about Astrid's father, which I barely even remembered happening because it just feels like such a derailment from the plot. Given that these two major plots about Dolores and Jeremy don't intersect in any way, it makes it feel like they're part of two completely different movies. And I honestly think they should have been used for separate movies. Not that I'm advocating for Beetlejuice to turn into a long-running franchise, but there's honestly enough great ideas in here to span an entire trilogy, which baffles me that they bogged down this movie by doing too much instead of, you know, making an executive happy and giving them another sequel opportunity. Which is odd considering the way this movie ends. I mean, there's no, like, big after credit scene teasing the next installment, but it ends on this note that left a lot of people speculating that they might be planning another one. Personally, I don't think that's the case. It felt like they were just trying to do a classic horror ending. I've heard some people compare it to the ending of Carrie, but I still wouldn't put it past Warner Brothers to try to make another one. So again, why did we dump all of these ideas into one movie? Maybe it's because people's attention spans are completely cooked and they're vying to keep your attention? I don't really know. But that being said, I do think they handled a lot of other aspects of this movie pretty well. I mean, every scene involving Catherine O'Hara is hilarious. She was really the standout for me. Likewise with Justin Thoreau, his character wasn't my favorite, but he made the most of it and he got a lot of laughs from my audience. Michael Keaton's performance is perfect and I'm so impressed that he was able to snap right back into this role after 36 years. Now that Charles Dietz's actor Jeffrey Jones got arrested and is on a registry, they obviously could not bring him back. And I thought the way they handled his character was really clever and funny. This movie is consistently and rightfully cruel to him. I mean, they didn't hold back at all. The absence of the Maitlands is fine. It would have been nice to get a little more of a connection to their characters other than a quick throwaway line, but I'm just glad they didn't go the de-aging technology route and try to bring them back though, so I guess I'll take that as a win. The same could be said about Otho's actor, Glenn Shaddix, who passed away in 2010. I'm just glad they didn't try to resurrect the actor's corpse for nostalgia baiting purposes. Looking at you, alien Romulus. But I think best of all, this film is just a lot of fun. My audience was cracking up at every joke. It nails the goofy and campy energy that the first film had. It obviously isn't as good as the original film, and I never thought it was going to be, but it feels like a worthy successor. And it's still better than a majority of legacy sequels that are being pushed out nowadays. And it's really fun to see people get excited about this movie. Every time I've been to a movie theater since this film's release, I see people dressing up in costumes and Beetlejuice themed outfits, and it's just so fun when we get a big event movie like this, which we haven't really had since last summer with Barbie and partially Oppenheimer. And after this year's particularly middling summer blockbuster lineup, this feels like a perfect transitional event movie from summer into spooky season. And speaking of Halloween, I'm actually in the process of putting together my annual 31 Days of Halloween watch list, which will include a mix of horror movies and spooky family films. And this year I've decided to make a full YouTube video about it where I'll briefly describe what I'm going to be watching every day in October. So if you're interested in joining this challenge with me, or if you just want a few good Halloween movie recommendations, make sure to subscribe and be on the lookout for that video sometime in late September. But I'm giving Beetlejuice Beetlejuice three and a half out of five stars. Thank you so much for watching. Remember to like this video and subscribe. Let me know in the comments what you thought of this movie and I'll see you next time. Thank you.